Um, but today it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Rob Cox for our talk. He's a regular here at the Historical Society. Um, and uh, I was, uh, he's the head of special collections at, and archives at the uh, UMass Amherst. And Agricultural College and its early early years. It was uh, began as a place for students anyway in 1867. And those first students who arrived here arrived on that campus up there, the two hills that form the east and west boundary of, of the inhabited part of, of the campus up there. Buildings were still under construction. The curriculum had been worked out, but nobody really knew what was going to come of this place. And I wanted to uh, think about a question that w in the archives we get all the time. And that is, what is it like to be a student during that early time? And specifically, what did they think about diversity in terms of campus in those early years? Was there any diversity? I would always assumed that given our origins and given our location here, that Mass Aggie was an entirely white place from the beginning. And it turns out not to be entirely true. It also turns out to be partially true, and it turns out to be a little more complicated than not entirely true. And only partially <laughs> true. It's a complicated thing, and UMass has its own particular history here, and its own history that I think is both something to look back on and recognize that we tried to do certain things very well, we failed to do other things very well. It's a history of who we are, and we should own that history and talk about what we can learn from this first 50 year period of UMass. And I'm roughly going from 1867 to uh, about 1917, but really it's only the last 20 years of that period of time, 1997 to 1917, that I'll be talking about for the most part. But uh, when you look at early UMass, when you look at, I'll call it UMass for the most part, the Mass Aggie, I'll go back and forth between the two. For the same. But when you look at Mass Aggie, UMass, in these early years, there are a few things to keep in mind about what campus was like. It was a very small, very intimate place. Classes during the latter part of the 19th century were not uniform in size whatsoever. The college started, it grew, it crashed, it grew, it crashed, and it leveled off at various points. You can go from 10 students in a class one year to 75 two or three years later. But it was a very small place. Most of the classes were in the dozens of students, not the many dozens of students. Everybody knew one another. Everybody lived close together. Students had a dining hall, one dining hall. Later, Draper Hall, which is still around, became the dining hall. But during the early years, there was a dining area up there. Students mostly lived on campus. Some lived off campus in boarding houses. But they lived in North College and South College, prior the original South College prior to the one that's been renovated most recently. So we have a very small, intimate campus. It was a cheap place. UMass was built for the sons of toil. Let's uh, go to the next slide, which is totally irrelevant. It was, uh, but it's a, it's a nice picture. Uh, it, it was a very small, intimate place built for sons of toil, people who came from working backgrounds, agricultural backgrounds. But very early in the history of this place, the students, and to a lesser degree, the faculty at UMass, struggling with finances, struggling with poor support for the legislature. And boy, I'm glad we've gotten over that issue of poor support for the legislature. <laughs> <laughs> but we, they, they got through this with dreams of doing something bigger. In the 1890s, already the students were lobbying to change the name from Mass Agricultural College to Mass State College. Because they wanted to see this college become something more than they thought it was. In the 1860s, when the first students arrived here, being an agricultural college was an advancement. It was something that was out there, something to be aspired to. It was viewed as novel and new, a practical education, not this classical education that they have at those deadbeats back east. Yeah. Uh, you know, the schools still haven't really become much of anything because they're stuck with that classical <laughs> curriculum. But I, out here, this agricultural curriculum devoted to the sciences, devoted to 
practical education was viewed as advanced. But that moment of time when that practical applied education was advanced, progressive, and thoughtful disappeared quite rapidly. By the 1890, the students were saying, we want to become a full, full college. We want to have a full education that would involve more than just agriculture. It would involve the humanities. It would involve other sciences. And it would be a much broader-based education. Some of the founders of Mass Aggie were still around. Levi Stockbridge among them, Stockbridge Hall, you may know. Levi Stockbridge was offended by this. He said, you don't know where we came from. We were the true progressives. You students don't understand. And it took another 20, 30, 40 years for the name to actually get to become Mass State. And then that became Old Hat, and we finally became New Mass. And that's Old Hat. I think we have to go somewhere different now. I'm not sure. It wasn't necessarily an inviting place, I thought, for, for students, who, uh, students of color, students who came from other backgrounds. And when you look at the student body, the vast majority of them did, in fact, come from Massachusetts. The majority of them did come from a rural Massachusetts background, <coughs> cultural intent. That's what they intended to do. That's what they brought in. And even though there was resistance from the students, this was the reality here. But it is not true that all students came from rural Mass and that all students were white. We had, in the very early years of UMass, we already had international students arriving. And what's interesting to me when I started looking at our list of international students is it looks very different than international students at other colleges. If you go to the elite schools, international students are coming from England, from France. They're coming from Western Europe. They're coming down from Canada. They're coming from locations that are up in the imperial chain, if you want to think of it that way. They're coming from those nations that have a strong conceptual connection to the United States, either ancestrally or trade-wise or politically. At UMass, that's not the case at all. We had virtually no, and I don't want to say no grad students from, from Western Europe during the early years. There were one or two, but virtually no. Our first international student is probably Simon Naito, who came here in 1872, class of 1872. He was the first international student, apparently, at Mass Aggie. I uh, threw up uh, Shiro Kuroda, who's class of 1895, because we had this steady stream of Japanese students who started coming here. And you may or may not know the story of William Smith Clark, who was technically the third president of Mass Aggie. He was practically speaking the first, because the other guys recognized what they were getting into and got out within a year. <laughs> but Clark really put everything he had into this institution. And Clark was one of these guys who really believed in the value of a progressive applied education. And he started building this agricultural college in the way that he thought it should be. And Clark also had in mind that this should be a general liberal arts college. We should have this agricultural basis that would push us forward, but we should also have a broad-based education to go with it. And Clark was constantly thwarted by the trustees and particularly by the legislature. But Clark established a connection with Japan very early on, and he was pretty famously, in, in local terms here, pretty famously courted by the imperial Japanese powers to come and help set up an agricultural cause that would be as progressive and as advanced as this brand new progressive advanced college in Massachusetts. So Clark went over in 1876 to help establish the uh, Sapporo Agricultural College, which is now Hokkaido University. We've had a connection with them ever since. But what often isn't said is that while Clark and faculty went over there and some students went over there to help educate and set up the school and continue the relationship over in Hokkaido, we had Japanese students coming over here on a fairly regular basis throughout the 19th and into the early 20th century. Some of them became pretty prominent folks. They came from prominent backgrounds, became pretty prominent folks. Bunzo Hashiguchi, who's class of 1881, is one of these guys who was sent over by the imperial government to learn to improve himself. And when he went back home, he became president of the National Sugar Beet Company there, taking sugar beets, which were thought of as being an advanced crop here, 
It came out of uh, the idea of getting away from a dependency on cane sugar, initially because of the connection to slavery, and later because of the connection to the climate. You grow sugar beets where you cannot grow sugar cane. So he brought sugar beets back to Japan with him and made a great deal of money. He ended up like becoming the uh, governor of Formosa, Japanese province of Formosa. So our graduates were going back to Japan and doing well, becoming known. They were coming over here to take the education that we have here, add on to what they brought, and bring it back to Japan so they could Japanize what they were learning here. We had other international students, and actually the first, uh, the, the other big group of international students were from Brazil here. And we had a steady stream of Brazilian students throughout the 19th century. Uh, Manuel Carneiro in 1878, the Almeida brothers in 85, 87, these are the three brothers who came here, are just some of the international students who came here from Brazil. Why? I, I, I'm not entirely sure. But we'll come back to that question in a second. But we had this succession of Brazilian students. Just as important were students from Turkey and to a much lesser degree from Cuba and Mexico. The Turkish students, a lot of them came from southeastern Turkey to come here. And I've been wondering, why is it, when we're looking at our international students, that the vast majority of international students here, and there are two or three in most classes, one, two, or three, in most classes in the last quarter of the 19th century. But they come from Japan, they come from Brazil, they come from Turkey, and they come from Cuba or Mexico. That's a very different profile than coming from Germany and France and Italy and, and England. Very different profile. I think there's a Canadian who sneaks in here. We probably didn't know where he's from. He's undocumented, I'm sure. <laughs> but here we have a succession of students, not one, but a succession of students arriving. I'm not entirely sure why we have these centers of distribution. In Japan makes sense because of the Clark connection. Once you establish a channel, people follow that channel. With the Turkish students, I've suspected, and I can't prove, that what happens is there are Massachusetts missionaries who are setting up in southeastern Turkey. We know that to be a fact. The American, bo uh, American Foreign Group, A, A F B C M A F C D. Yeah, sorry. Right. The American Board of Foreign Missionaries, whatever the heck it is, I'm now just juggling my words. But those words are in there. We arrange them any way that makes sense. They set up in Turkey, and I believe there's a good likelihood that one of those Massachusetts ministers, acting as a missionary in Turkey, is out there saying, if you're looking for an education in an American university, well, I know this place in Massachusetts where you can get a practical hands-on education, which fits with what missionaries are trying to do to elevate and civilize these poor, benighted Turks. When Chinese students begin coming to UMass, which is just around the turn of the century, a little bit later, I'm pretty confident looking at that, that, that pattern holds true for them. <laughs> The first Chinese student comes when Henry Hill Goodell, who I'll come back to in a minute. Henry Hill Goodell is taking a train and sits next to a member of a Chinese legation to the United States at that time, right after the Chinese Exclusion Act is passed. Oh. Lovely, lovely timing. But he says, would it be OK if we send Chinese students to UMass? And Goodell says, yeah, sure. And so we begin to get Chinese students arriving at UMass right around the turn of the century. And they come from missionary centers in China. So I suspect the same overlay, the Turks and the Chinese fits. It's not clear Cubans or Brazilians or Mexicans fit that pattern, but that's the pattern. So Goodell, who I just mentioned, is a critical piece in this. He's, it's not just because of the facial hair, which I admire greatly, <laughs> but, but Goodell is a key figure in our history who's been, I think, greatly under-recognized. He's usually thought of as a guy who, to some degree, sat in the office of president after having been at the university for a long time as a, as a bureaucrat. He's well-remembered because there's a building named after him. But Goodell was far more innovative than I think people have given him credit for. Goodell was president during the 1890s. There's a depression in the country. It's a hard time for the university in, in general. 
And Goodell, in his quiet way, set about revolutionizing this place, this UMass as a place. Among other things, he decided that we should look at academic standards. We should try to raise the standard of the students who are admitted here. He said we should think about doing things like an extension service founded under here. The graduate school was founded under his time. There was curricular revolution under his time here. Prior to Goodell, students came in, they were put into a very rigorous course load in which every freshman took the same classes, every sophomore took the same classes, all the way up. Goodell introduced the idea of electives, which students like, and he introduced the idea of humanities as being a thing that we would focus on and that you could major in other areas, so to speak. So a lot of these issues come down in Goodell's time here. There are things that seem so obvious today that we think they go all the way back. They do not. They go back to Goodell. Goodell is a critical figure. Goodell is often recognized also for being here, not necessarily starting, but being here when the first women began arriving on campus. Now, it's true that people at Mass Aggie have been talking about admitting women all the way back to at least 1870. That's the earliest reference I can find. William Smith Clark talked about educating the young men and women of the Commonwealth. He just didn't bother with the women part. Fine by me. Not, not that I'm bitter, but with, with Goodell. Goodell decided that there was something that we could do, and that is not stand in the way. That's, his, that's all he did, was decided we're not going to stand in the way. The first woman to arrive at Mass Aggie was probably in 1875 when a, a woman named Louise Bellison Thurston arrived. She came from Lynn, arrived here as a special student where students could come in as effectively a non-degree course. You could focus on a few things, you could take a few classes, you could advance yourself in botany or, or so forth, whatever you chose to focus on, and then move on in life. And, and Thurston came here in 1875, spent a year here. She was involved in the life of campus. She was a member of, of the uh, literary society that was on campus at the time. She interacted with male students in her classroom and out of the classroom. But she left after about a year, became a teacher, and spent the rest of her life teaching. I discovered there's another woman who was recorded here. Uh, I discovered this this morning, quite literally, a woman who was recorded here as a special student just a couple of years later. It turns out a very interesting woman from the eastern side of the state who had uh, been born in the 1840s. And in her 30s, she came here as a special student. Her father had been an educator. Uh, a physician and a, a sorry, educator, a physician, and had been sort of on the edge of the transcendentalist circles and the abolitionist circles of Eastern Mass. He had all those affinities, and she was the only child that of that father. And she had these progressive ideas. So after she graduated from college at the age of 16, she set herself up as a teacher and taught high school. But what she did with her own time, she never was married, but what she did with her own time was attend school. She went at least two summers at Harvard taking chemistry and botany. She took a, 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 apparently a year of leave to study at MIT and then came to UMass for a year to study botany and horticulture here. So these women are arriving first as special students to take a specialized course of study to advance themselves a little bit. Florence May Valentine arrives here as the first regular student in 1896. And Valentine uh, enrolled from Florence Mass. She didn't last long. She had to leave uh, because of a lack of funds. The school was really not set up to accommodate her. She had to be boarded in a professor's house. But she was just the first. She arrived in 1892 with the class of 1896. I should be specific about that. But she was the first of a small string of women who began arriving during the Goodell years. It took a couple of years more uh, before the next ones come. But by the class of 1905, we're starting to see more and more women here. Um, I, there's a little poem here from a woman who arrived as a member of class of 1903. Class of 1905, you can look down here and see there are two women here in this picture, uh, whom I'm not seeing right now. Right there they are. In the middle. They yeah. are right in the middle. And uh, th this is the first wave of women to really settle and 
UMass as regular undergraduate students. There's one with Lily Bertha Allen, class of 1903, who also left after one term like Florence Valentine. And uh, there's a little poem in the student newspaper, because this, this, the male students were quite divided on whether this was a good thing. There were some male students who thought it was, it was absolutely essential, this is the right thing to do, the moral thing to do. There were others who were very concerned about the fact that we had two women's colleges nearby and it would change our relationship with them. And if a woman wanted to go to college, there were places for them to go, they didn't have to come to Mass Aggie. Poor argument, but that's the way they did it. So, 1903, Lily Bertha Allen, there's a poem when she arrives here that appears in the student, uh, student newspaper, uh, student yearbook, pardon me. It says, I'll sing you a song of college girls. It gives you a sense of, of what the male students thinking at the time. I'll tell you where to go. Mount Holyoke to learn to fuss, and my wife is a Mount Holyoke alum. <laughs> Smith to spend your dough. Wellesley, where my grandmother went, for your grand old maids. She was an old maid. Uh, Simmons for the slow ones, and I teach at Simmons. So. <laughs> <laughs> for wise ones, go to Radcliffe, but for your beauties, Massachusetts. Now, it's a beautiful oh. poem, of course. <laughs> but the point is, women arriving here were not necessarily welcome and not necessarily rejected. They were a part of the landscape that began arriving. Goodell had a philosophy when he was asked before the first woman arrived. He said, if they want to apply, they can apply. If they want to come, they can come. That was Goodell's reasoning. No barriers, no uh, recruiting, but let's open the door and let them come in if they wish. A couple of women did graduate, class of 1905, and we have, some of them did very well in life. Esther Cowles Cushman uh, uh, was uh, from Northampton originally, Phi Beta Kappa. Uh, Monica Sanborn from Salem ended up getting some awards and uh, horticulturalist and so forth in her life. And we had our first graduate student, who's a Smith undergraduate who came here, we had her first master's degree right at that same time, 1905, 1906. So women are beginning to come on campus in small numbers. Now, I was thinking about this, and I said, hmm, you know, there might be something more to think about than just women and these international students. And I was very concerned about the question of when the first African-American student comes. And I was flipping through our old photos, and I looked at this great photo of football being played right in front of Old Chapel in 1901. And I said, huh. You know, this is a nice, nice image, shows you where the football field was. And then I noticed, smack in the middle, is an African-American student. When, when does the first African-American student arrive? So what I've done over the, the, the course of this little project is begin with this question of what was it like to be a student here? What was it like in terms of diversity in male, female, international, domestic? and ask the question about race beyond international race. And it turns out it's an interesting group of people. Between 1897 and about 1914, let's put that as the upper limit, we see a stream of African American students being admitted to Mass Aggie. The classes are very small, a handful of students. In each class, not in each class, but in many of the classes during this period of time, you see one student admitted into the college. At any one time, you might have two, three, or even four African-American students in a student body of 100 or so. A small number, but present. This group of nine, and I'll mention a tenth guy as well, but this group of nine are a very unusual group of students. And I would say a very distinguished group of students. When you compare them to their peers, and when you look at their subsequent careers, they're really, truly a remarkable group of people who arrived here. And it's probably not coincidental that these guys, the pioneers coming up here, were the high achievers. They're entrepreneurial, they're energetic, they're highly intelligent, and they are doing things to press the case, not simply for themselves, but for their race in their mind. So the first guy to arrive here is this guy, George Ruffin Bridgeforth. Arrives here in the fall of 1897. Bridgeforth was originally from Alabama. 
And in many ways, he is the model for these first nine students who arrive here. Born in Alabama in 1879, uh, I'm doing this off the top of my head, I hope that I have that year, sorry, 1873, it's another guy that's 1879. He studied at Talladega. Now, Talladega is an HBCU, Historically Black College and University. That makes sense, he got his degree there before coming up here. But it's interesting, I said, well, what does Talladega have to do with UMass? Why would you come from Talladega, Alabama, up to UMass? And I don't have a real answer to that. I said, well, you know, somebody in the trustees or somebody in the administration must have said, let's bring an African-American student up to help education in the South. Let's help with racial uplift, this project that this guy Booker T. Washington is talking about. Let's help with that. It doesn't seem to be true. There seems to have been no decision made to accept or reject African-American students. They simply appear, as far as I can tell. I have not found that smoking gun yet. Why did he come from Talladega up here? It's a little hard to know, but the one key piece of information that I found thus far is that there were some faculty here and some students here who had an interest in African American life and uh, politics, if you want to put it that way, in the South. We had Clark who had fought during the Civil War. That's not an insignificant thing, so he was aware of the war over slavery. We had a faculty member here, Al Ward, who had been in the 10th Cavalry during the war, which was one of the Buffalo Soldiers units after the war. We had another one, Henry Hill Goodell, whom I've mentioned, who had served in a white regiment, the 20th of Connecticut, a nine-month regiment that served down south. The 20th of Connecticut is an entirely forgettable regiment, except for the fact that their service was in Louisiana, and they were involved in the siege of Port Hudson where African-American uh, soldiers were very prominent, right on the front lines, and the 25th Connecticut was surrounded on all sides by African-American soldiers. So Goodell was at least aware of African-American struggle for freedom. Probably more importantly for this, we had two graduates of Mass Aggie, class of 1882 and 1885, if I remember, who were originally from Peacedale, Rhode Island, who came out and after they graduated, the Bishop brothers, Edgar and, uh, Edgar and William, William the older, Edgar the younger, went down south. William taught for a while at Tougaloo, an HBCU, and he had a career in HBCUs going from there to the other. Edgar, most importantly, went to Talladega. And he's, he was at Talladega for a number of years and remained teaching in HBCUs for many years. It's interesting that not only do we have him down in Talladega, but in the 1890s, 18, in the early 1890s, I think it was 1892, Edgar and a classmate of his, John Cutter, wrote to the student newspaper imploring the students each to donate 25 cents to the cause of African American education in the South. So there's a likely link between this young man, born the first generation after slavery in Alabama, goes to Talladega, gets an education, and meets a UMass alum, and says, I can continue my education up north. He comes up here and there's no barrier. They admit him. Goodell, in his open door policy, if you want to call it that, admits him. And he arrives in the fall of 1896. He has a remarkable career here in many ways. After his first year here, he has to petition the trustees because he does not have enough money to continue his education. And so he petitions, along with a Turkish student, to have the trustees waive tuition and fees for him. And they do it. So he remains. Bridgeforth, you can see, played football. This is a critical factor with these first nine students, almost all of whom played football, oddly enough. Bridgeforth was academically highly proficient. He was an older student than his fellow classmates. And perhaps for that reason, he was maybe a little more focused on his academic studies. He was awarded the Flint Oratorical Prize, which I'll, I'll, you'll hear more again for oratory for speech. He was a surgeon at arms for his sophomore class. He was a member of the rope pull team, which was the big inter-class rivalry event that they had at UMass. 
He was a member of the College Shakespearean Club, which was a very popular social intellectual club at UMass. He was even called upon to address the local Amherst Grange. We don't know what on what topic in his case, except that it was on the agriculture of the South. It was the agriculture of the South, but the local Grange here. So Bridgeforth is brought in here to speak to them. And Bridgeforth did very well as a, as a, as a football player and as a uh, student, as they say. The other piece of information that I found on Bridgeforth, which I found was quite interesting, is where did he live? He said, well, he was an African-American student. Was he integrated with white students? Did he live in the same housing? Well, it's a little hard to know exactly where he lived year to year, but I do have the 1900 census. In the 1900 census, I noticed that he was living on East Pleasant Street, which would be where? Somebody, all the Pleasants or whatever they are. You know, it's one of the Pleasants or the Mains. It's up by the water tower. OK. Um, <laughs> it's up by the water tower. <laughs> he lived in the home of a woman named Louisa Baker. And I, I didn't recognize that name at first, but it turns out that when Louisa Baker died, there was a little obituary in the student newspaper because Louisa Baker turns out to be an interesting woman. She was from the family that sold the land that became Mass Agricultural College. And she, in this obituary, says, had an ongoing abiding interest in the poor of this nation and the colored people of the South. Oh. Philanthropic interest. And here's a quote that says, she delighted in acting a mother's part towards boys who came to college determined to pay their own bills as far as possible. She opened her house to such and always had one or more occupying rooms under her roof. She gave them employment, looked sharply after the conduct and habits. The number of Aggie boys whom she has helped in one way or another is unknown to any except for her. Many of them she helped financially to secure their education at MAC, at MAC. She advanced the money to complete their professional studies in universities, in some cases, welcomed their sons when they, too, came to their father's college. He lived in Louisa Baker's house, along with two other Mass Aggie students, both of them were white. So they were somewhat, to some degree, integrated here. We know a few other things about Bridgeforth. When he was a student here, in his sophomore year, he accidentally blew up a stick of dynamite in his face, and he <coughs> hasn't done that. <laughs> but in Bridgeforth's case, it caused some significant damage. He had some temporary hearing loss, but he recovered and came back to school. When he graduated, he went down to back to Alabama, and ensconced himself at Tuskegee, where he became the head of the farm under Booker T. Washington. He had quite a rivalry there with other people, George Washington Carver amongst them in particular. And he was somewhat protected by Booker T. apparently. He was called a big, energetic, blustery man who had his own ideas. He brought down the idea of an extension service that he had seen up here to Tuskegee and created a sort of extension service to African-American farmers in Alabama that he forwarded. And it was a success down there. He was viewed as an ambitious, seeking guy. And when Booker T died, all this conflict with George Washington Carver, who was a little bit more laid back in many ways, ended up in Bridgeforth deciding to leave or being asked to leave Tuskegee, depending on who you read. He ended up becoming the president of an African-American school in Kansas, uh, lasted there for a little while, and then moved back to Alabama for a final time and set up a community called Beulah Land, which as far as I can tell, a little hard to know the specifics of it, appears to have been a community of African-Americans in northern Alabama that sought to be somewhat semi-independent, to create a, a little small economy of their own where they could support one another and live in that environment. And Beulah Land and, and its descendants are, there is still a little bit of history uh, there to see. So here's class of 1901. 1903, we actually have two African American students who arrived at the same time. William W. Peebles, down here in the front, came from a middle class uh, family from DC. His father was a, in construction in DC, his mother was a school teacher. He grew up around education. He grew up around middle-class attitudes, middle-class ideas. William W. Hood, up in the top there, was another Alabama. Came, from, came here from Alabama. He also came here from Talladega. He was a graduate of Talladega. Peebles, uh, I think, is the exception 
among these first nine students in many ways, and I'll explain why that is first. But Hood is very much typical of many of these first nine graduates. An Alabama, he came here, arrived in 19, 1899, stayed here until 1903. He was called in the student yearbook in a very enigmatic phrase to me, the whitest man of his race. I suspect that was intended as a compliment. I'm not sure it would have been read as one, but he was intended that way. It was presumably intended that way. He lived, and this is one situation where we know, he shared a room for at least one year with Peebles in North College. So they were integrated on the floor, but they shared a room together in that college. It doesn't appear that anyone else was in there, it was the two of them, no white folk. He was considered to be one of the most patriotic men in his college, as well as the whitest man of his race. And he went on, like eight of the first nine African American graduates at Mass Aggie, to teach in HBCUs after he left here. He taught at uh, an Indian college in Oklahoma and a Sango Baptist College, which was an African American school that lasted for a short time in Oklahoma. Peebles is a very interesting guy. He does not look like a football player. But he was a football player, as I believe Hood was as well. Peebles looks like a scholar. He, he really is you know, dressed well, very prim and proper. He does look that way. And he was a member of that College Shakespearean Club, a member of the Mass Aggie Reading Room uh, Association. He won the Burnham Prize, which is another one of these students. And he won that Burnham Prize for talking about Booker, T's, Booker T. Washington's address to the Harvard <laughs> alumni. We do not have a copy of that prize. I wish we did. He was a member of the Forensic Club, and when he was a member of that Forensic Club, he <coughs> argued on the, the debate club, in effect. He argued against American imperial aggression in the Philippines, which was a very current topic of the day. At commencement, Peebles was brought out and asked to be one of the speakers, and uh, he sang the college song, and he gave a talk on Southern injustice. We don't have a copy of his speech, but I would die to see it. Now, he went a different way. Instead of going and teaching in HBCUs, he went, he got a degree. Actually, he served in the military, pardon me, I should say first in the First World War, rose to the rank of captain. He got a degree in dentistry, and I think that's actually before he served the First World War, but anyway, he got a degree in dentistry, and he spent a career in Omaha as a dentist, a very distinguished member of the community, very successful man, came from a you know, solid middle class background, upper north, uh, uh, pardon me, upper south in DC, but a little atypical of our students. Go to the next slide. The Huber brothers come here, class of 1904, class of 1912, two brothers, very distinguished guys in their own way. Zachary Hubert on the left, the older one, born in Georgia in 1877, and the Huberts were rather an impressive family. Their father is said to have been uh, born in slavery, liberated at the end of the Civil War. And somehow, his father scraped together money and purchased land. They didn't stay where they were. They went out and they purchased land. And they became the first, uh, apparently, the first significant African American landholders in Central Georgia. These guys emphasized in their family from liberation to the present day, education. All of the Huber <coughs> boys go to Morehouse College, and these two Huber brothers went to Morehouse College. They played football at Morehouse College. They came here and played football here as well. Zachary Hubert went on to a career of teaching at historic black colleges and universities. Uh, he became an agricultural professor at Florida A&M and later president so that's the second president of these early grads at Jackson College in Oklahoma and then at Langston College in Oklahoma. Uh, Langston College, pardon me. So a fairly distinguished guy. Benjamin Huber, his younger brother, was even more successful in many ways. When he was here, he also won the Flint Oratorical Prize. He was awarded the special gold medal and $20 in cash, an enormous amount of money at that time, even for me. By the way, I take gifts. Uh, but, his speech for that is the larger freedom of the Negro. We don't have a copy of his speech, but I would die for it. At least I haven't been able to find it. 
It was called a sustained and effective appeal for the betterment of conditions among Negroes of the South. And it's interesting that the second place at that oration contest was from a Chinese student, Yong Chun, uh, one of Mass Aggie's first, but not the first uh, uh, a Chinese student at Mass Aggie. And he spoke in defense of his people as well. And particularly the, the values of education and morality and nationality as it applied to modern China. So he was a small guy, only five foot eight, but as I say, he played football. He was uh, an all South colored back when he was at Morehouse and he was successful here. When he left here, he also went to Tuskegee. He was also the head of their Department of Agriculture for a little bit and went on to become a president of Georgia State Industrial College. So again, that's the third president of HBCU that we have coming out of our first nine students. He, had, he wrote, and so did Bridgeforth, and so did a couple of these other guys, to W.B. Du Bois. And I found a very interesting letter from Du Bois to him in 1942. <coughs> in uh, Zachary's life, he died fairly early. Uh, uh, Benjamin's life, pardon me, he died fairly early. In which Du Bois, talking about the area of, uh, of education, he says, Du Bois says, far from believing that we should begin at the bottom and work up, I distinctly believe that we should begin at the top and use the educated power at the top to lift the masses at the bottom. Higher education is not for itself and its own employment, but furnishes the power and the leverage by which the mass of the people can obtain not only economic security, but cultural progress. What I'm trying to do then is to obtain for the masses, especially in their industrial development, the leadership of college graduates. All of these guys felt that burden. All of these guys lived that life. They may have disagreed with the boys in many ways, but all of them felt the importance of education. Class of 1905, you can see a couple of women here. And over here, William Craighead Hunley. Uh, sorry, William Hunley Craighead, uh, who was a remarkable individual in his way. He was also a winner of the Flint Oratorical Prize. He was a Virginian who came up here. He had studied at Howard and received a degree at Howard before arriving in Mass Aggie. He was not a small guy for his, for his period. He was six foot tall, close to 200 pounds. And he played varsity football here from his beginning. In fact, his coach, it was the tenth guy, Craighead there. His coach, I'm uh, sorry, Hunley, his coach is not in this picture. I thought he was. But, but his coach was the first, was uh, Matthew Bullock, who was a graduate of Dartmouth College, who came here and coached football at Mass Aggie for three different years during the time that Craighead was here. And during those three years, he's considered to be, or well, his three years are considered to be the first African-American coach of a sport at a predominantly white university. Craighead became the first captain of a sport team at a predominantly white university under uh, Bullock's leadership. The football team, which was pretty abysmal most years, became actually not so embarrassing Okay. under Bullock's time, and, and Craighead was an important piece of that. Uh, he went on to become a, uh, an educator. He, he did sort of extension work among an African-American population in, in Virginia, where he was originally from. Uh, so slightly different direction. He didn't teach in HBCU, but he was still committed to educating people. Now, John Carruthers, this guy I brought in here, 1907, came here after having a degree at Nashville University. Uh, it says here he joined the class of 1907, this is in the yearbook, and has never since regretted his choice. He's been a strong man for the class, having filled with dignity the position of Sergeant at Arms and having been rope pole captain for two years. As a result, uh, Naughty Seven holds two trophies well won, 1907. He was second prize in the Grinnell Agricultural Prize, and he went on and he taught at the Manual and Colored uh, Industrial School for Colored Youth in Vineland, New Jersey. Now, he graduated in 1907. By that point, Goodell had gone, and his successor, Kenyon Butterfield, had come in. Butterfield is usually recognized as the president who took women's education to a different level at Mass Aggie. When Butterfield came in, he said, let us emphasize women. Let us begin <laughs> offering courses for women. Let us not just open up the opportunity for women to come here, but let's try to create an environment in which they can come and be sustained and study what they want to study. 
introduced rural sociology to Mass Aggie, which he thought would attract women, and it did. Under his administration, they built the first dormitory for women, which is now burned down, but uh, burned down 1962 or so, but it's long gone. But what's interesting to me is that this little track record of African American students who began creeping in here in 1896 stops. Doesn't seem to have been a decision. It doesn't seem to be anything where the trustees said no more. It doesn't even seem to be anything where we can see Butterfield making a comment. It simply stops. Now he graduates in 1907, which is the end of Butterfield's first year at Mass Aggie. And I find it very interesting that as he goes and takes his position in Vineland, New Jersey, one of the first things he does is he writes back to Mass Aggie and he invites Butterfield to come down and give the commencement speech to his graduating students at the Manual of Training School. And Butterfield does that. But it's the end of a period of time. We have one other student that I'll, I'll talk about. There are a couple of others uh, that we've done work on, but one other student that I'll talk about just because of the local interest. If I were going to summarize about the nine students here, I would say that eight of the nine came from the South. All uh, eight of the nine came already with a degree from a historically black college or university. Eight of the nine went into teaching, mostly at historical black colleges and universities. Eight of the nine played football during their time here. Eight of the nine were engaged in social clubs and intellectual life at the university in a way that would have stood out among the student body, winning awards, uh, being parts of debates and contests, speaking publicly. Three of them went on to be presidents of HBCUs themselves. One of the guys, this is Matthew Bullock, by the way, uh, uh, but one of the guys down here that doesn't quite fit the pattern is this guy, Charles Roberts, who came from Amherst. He was actually born in Vermont, if I remember correctly, Bellows Falls, Vermont, 1887. His father was a custodian at the Society House in Amherst here. And I do not know where the Society House is, but I believe it was there. This was Perry Roberts? This is Perry Roberts' family, yes, yes. Perry Roberts is Charles Roberts' father. And uh, Perry Roberts had married a woman who, uh, uh, I'm sorry, had a French-Canadian grandmother. So Roberts came here, he played football here, he injured his knee at some point in his sophomore year, I think it was, and he never completed his degree. He did go back to uh, running track after injuring his knee, but he was never apparently quite the same. And for whatever reason, probably lack of money, he, he went away without ever getting his degree here. But what is interesting about Charles Roberts is even without his lack of degree, he went out and he did commit himself to education of African American people. He shows up in 1917, pardon me, as the director of athletics at Lincoln University outside of Philadelphia. He wasn't there long but he filled that role. And the Roberts family are still around in Amherst, as I understand. The Robertses, during his time here, lived on Hazel Street, right below the football fields at Amherst College there. A little community of African-American people there, but mostly the Robertses, as far as I know. So it's a very interesting pattern. He is the exception to the rule here. Why it stopped is hard to understand. Why it stopped, we don't have any evidence of why it started why we start seeing African-American students arriving. There's a couple of conjectures that I have. One is that idea that I mentioned earlier about this personal connection of Mass Aggie people working in HBCU South. That is certainly a piece of some of it. I think it's also a period of time in which the second Morrill Land Grant Act is passed, which specifies that money must go in the South to both white and black colleges. You can't just, if you're Alabama, spend it simply on the white students. You need to put money to the black students. And that raises an interest all over the South in developing educational talent and professorial skills amongst their population. And Alabamians and so forth, what do they do? Well, they go up to established colleges in the North to get a little extra education and bring back with them. And that seems to fit what we see here with these students. Why it ended is hard to understand. It does not entirely stop. 
But it's not again until the 1960s that you begin to see significant numbers of African American students arriving here. The first African American faculty member is Ed Driver, sociology, 1947, I think it is, when he arrives here. He is one of the first two African Americans hired as a sociologist, a sociology faculty at a white university. And he arrives here as a 23 year old. How does he get here? Well, there was a faculty member of Smith in sociology who was taking a sabbatical down at the University of Pennsylvania and was sitting in a seminar and saw this young man whom he thought very highly of. And he says, you ought to apply for this job we have at Smith. Driver apparently applied for that job and didn't get it. And so this guy, the Smith prof said, well, look over at Mass Aggie. Well, UMass at that point. He said, maybe you ought to go there. And Driver came over to UMass, was hired as a 23-year-old, ended up finishing his degree. He taught sociology for many years. He retired, I think it was maybe in the 80s. Uh, but he was uh, a successful, popular lecturer here at Mass Aggie, but one of very, very few. I know when uh, Bill Brommer came here, he was, I think, the seventh faculty member of color, African-American faculty member, pardon me, on campus here when he arrived. And very small numbers. Driver lasted. Driver is apparently still alive, as I say. But small numbers of people here who are part of this, and it's not until 68, 69 and 70, where we begin to see student agitation, assisted by faculty and administration, that we begin to see these numbers change. But there's this brief window where we're doing the right thing. So I'll stop there. If you've got questions, we'd like to try to answer. How, how selective was it when this university in these years? Did everyone who applied get in? or? It seems that way, but it's it's not entirely true. You know, there are standards. There are things that you had to do. You couldn't get in if you couldn't read and write, that kind of thing. But I think the standards by modern standards, you know, everything was different back in the day. You would apply. You had to have certain prerequisites, certain skills to come in. Uh, but it was not, uh, you, you're not taking a test and getting a score above such. And then there's no change in that at the point where the black students I, I'm not aware of that being involved in either students coming here or students not coming here, students of color not coming here. And I, I really can't get down to even the details about what the requirements were for arriving here. One of the potential uh, differences here, and uh, John Bracey, who uh, is head of the Afro-American Department, suggested it to me. He said one of the possibilities is that while it makes sense for uh, an aspiring academic, African-American aspiring academic in Alabama in 1897 to come up north and try to continue the education. By 1911, 1912, 1914, there are more opportunities in those schools that were started in the second land grant act to get your education down south. But certainly there are northern blacks too. Yes, and, and, and we, had one. Yeah. we had one. We had one. So the, the African-American population in Massachusetts is very small. It's not zero, but it is small at the turn of the century. And so we're not dealing with a massive population here. But it is interesting to me that we see one mm -hmm. during this period of time when we have eight others. Bullock is a guy, a local guy, goes to Dartmouth and comes here and gets hired here. But you know that's, that's a different game. Like that. It's, there's a lot of mysteries here, a lot of fuzziness right under the, under the hood. And I, expected all along to find a letter in which someone says, here's a plan. Here's what we're going to do. Or, gee, I have an application. Let's do it. Nothing yet. Oh. Nothing yet. Hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.